Okay, we'll go ahead and jump into the next uh, session. We're really just uh, blending here now, session three and four into, uh, into one, since we're all kind of in the same theme. Um, and so Ekta Karana is gonna continue on the, uh, the themes from the first few talks, and then we're gonna blend into uh, a functional analysis with uh, Tim Reddy and Matt Friedman. So um, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me in such a great list of speakers. And uh, so I'm going to continue on the cancer theme, which you heard before the break. So a lot of it is going to be revision of what you heard, because it's uh, sim in, the, in the similar spirit. Uh, but hopefully you, uh, I can talk about some things uh, that we are doing in the lab. That's, uh, uh, so that's what I'll be discussing, the methods that we are dis uh, de developing. Um, I will start with this slide, which everybody I think here in this room knows that the cost of whole genome sequencing has been dropping. But the reason I show this slide is to stress the, uh, the, pre the availability of cancer whole genomes. So um, in 2008, we had the first cancer whole genome sequence, but now we have more than 3,000 whole genome sequences available just from ICGC and TCGA. And, um, for these sequences, I think some of you might know about this effort called the Pan-Cancer Analysis of Whole Genomes, which is a collaboration between ICGC and TCGA. And the main motivation behind this effort was that a lot of these cancer whole genome sequences that have actually been sequenced by researchers have not really been analyzed. So the data is the sequencing was done, but in many cases, even the mutations were not called. And the major reason for that, I think, was that people don't know, didn't know until very recently what to do with non-coding regions in cancer. And now, as you can see from this session and, you know, uh, from the interest of everybody here, there is a very uh, increased interest in non-coding regions in cancer, which was the motivation behind this big consortium effort, which is now close to 1,000 people, I think. So I'm aware, my lab and myself, we are very active members of this effort and uh, variant calls are going to be ready soon from 3,000 whole genomes and uh, then we're going to analyze and hopefully get uh, all the results uh, from analyzing this big scale of data sometime uh, soon. So uh, as some of the slides that I present are going to echo, like I said, what the speakers before uh, said, which is, you know, uh, the concepts about the non-coding variants in the cancer genome. Uh, so this is something that Matthew also showed, and we know that most of the variants when you sequence cancer whole genomes lie in non-coding regions of the genome, not surprisingly because most of the genome is non-coding. So this is uh, showing the ratio for uh, uh, all these different cancer types from TCGA, and as you can see that 96 to 99.9% 9 .9 of variants in some samples lie in non-coding regions. So uh, uh, I'm, there are many modes, as you have been uh, listening uh, in throughout the session and even yesterday, how non-coding var sequence variants can have an impact on disease and, and uh, in this case, cancer. But uh, the one of the most common modes that you have been uh, listening is a, the uh, disruption of transcription factor binding. So uh, the most famous example that came, uh, that we made non-coding regions popular in the cancer community, I think, is that of the TERT promoter. So in 2013, there were two papers published back to back in Science that talked about uh, highly recurrent uh, mutations in the promoter of the TERT gene in melanoma. And this kind of started a wave of everybody starting to look at the non-coding regions, and then I think in uh, in the next two years, within the next two years, there were about 50 papers published that talked about how people are seeing mutations in so many different types of cancer in the promoter of the TERT gene. And uh, this is a table from Kilela et al. that shows uh, that the TERT promoter is mutated in all these different cancer types, and in some at really high frequencies, like 79.1 here. So, uh, and the result of this is that actually the TERT promoter mutations have made it to the clinical uh, stage, I mean, uh, because for example, the Memorial Sloan Kettering panel, which tests for cancer mutations in large cohorts, actually tests for the presence of the TERT promoter too. So uh, another famous example that was highlighted recently was the creation of the MIB uh, motive that drives Dalvin overexpression in TL ALL. So these were some of the few uh, early examples that came, and then now, as you already heard in three wonderful talks before me, uh, there are many examples that we are finding in the non-coding genome. And I'm going to talk about uh, some of the methods that we have developed and what we are identifying using those methods. Uh, 
So before I start talking about the methods, this is also a message that was echoed uh, by all the, uh, all the talks before, and especially in Shamil's talk, about the covariates of the mutation rates. So like Shamil explained very beautifully, uh, that uh, there, are, there is a lot of heterogeneity in mutation rates in the genome, and there are factors that lead to this heterogeneity, especially in the non-coding regions. So this example that uh, Shabel also described is that the regions of open chromatin are generally showing lower mutation density, but if you lo look within those regions at the exact places where transcription factors bind, they are showing higher density, and this was shown beautifully in two recent papers in Nature that it's, it's because, of the, uh, because these transcription factor uh, binding actually impairs the binding of the nucleotide excision repair proteins, which is why you see the specific increasing mutation density in the cancer types where nucleotide excision repair is the process of uh, repair mechanism, so is the repair, uh, prominent repair mechanism, which is uh, lung cancer and uh, melanoma. So these examples, you know, this, these phenomena are very new. These papers were published this year. So we are just understanding what are the covariates of the mutation rates in this complex non-coding genome. And uh, a message that, uh, that I'm again saying, uh, repeating from the earlier talks, is we have to really account for these when we build our computational models to identify the drivers, because otherwise that can lead to a lot of false positive uh, signals, which are hotspots of mutations, but not necessarily drivers. So the basic idea how we look for drivers is by looking at uh, for positive selection, which is recurrence across multiple genomes. And if this recurrence happens because of these, uh, because of these uh, mechanisms and not because they were positively selected, then we'll reach uh, to result that there are many uh, drivers, which is not true. So uh, I'm going to discuss two major methods. Uh, first method is uh, something that I developed when I was a postdoc in uh, Mark Gershteen's lab at Yale, and which we call FunSeq because it's so much fun to run. It's uh, or it's because of the fu uh, it was for functional based prioritization of sequence variants. And then I'm going to discuss another method that we are developing in my lab, which basically uh, converges the signals of the functional importance and the recurrence and account for the covariates to identify the driver elements uh, and gives the p-value what is the likelihood this region is going to be a driver and uh, that we are calling composite driver. So uh, I think this is, a, this is a slight kind of combining some of the things that we heard yesterday and uh, what we heard today about the germline genomes, the GWAS and the somatic genomes. So this is just to give you an idea when we are looking at the, um, when we try to identify non-coding variants associated with cancer, then the most common approach to identify those, the germline variants associated with cancer susceptibility for the common variants is through GWAS. And for the rare variants, it's through the, germ, uh, it's through the whole genome sequencing. And when we talk about the drivers in the somatic cancer genome, then we need the whole genome sequencing uh, to identify these mutations in the non-coding genome. And uh, so these are, and the, after we have these, uh, we have the data collected, then there are statistical tests for enrichment. So this is a very, very broad outline of how generally we identify non-coding variants associated with cancer. And uh, then there are many methods for computational-based prioritization and functional interpretation, including our FUNSEQ, uh, which, we are going to, which I'm going to talk about. And then th this is followed by experimental validation to make sure that this prediction is really true. It's having a functional impact, which hopefully will lead to a lot, a lot of translation to the clinic. It has led to one, but hopefully we'll see more soon. So uh, first I'm going to talk about our approach FUNSEQ, which is for the, uh, for the functional prioritization. And I would just like to note that this approach can be used uh, not only for somatic variants, but also for germline variants to infer uh, what, it, what is going to be the functional impact of non-coding mutations. So uh, the idea behind this approach was uh, to look for regions in the non-coding genome that are under negative selection. So here, and by negative selection, I'm talking about negative selection in germline, in, uh, not in somatic genomes, uh, but in germline. So the idea here was that if we understand the patterns of polymorphisms in healthy human genomes, then we can use those patterns to identify what are going to be high functional impact mutations, or in case of cancer, the driver mutations. But first we need to understand which, uh, which regions in the genome normally 
are under negative selection, do not want to mutate. And uh, of course, I'm sure everybody knows that the evolutionary conservation across multiple species has been used to detect signals of negative selection. And uh, we also included, besides that, and uh, importantly, the signal for across human population from the 1,000 genomes data. So the idea here was that if we find regions that are depleted of common variants, or in, in other words, enriched for rare variants, which is the same thing, then uh, we are going to identify the regions where if mutations hit, are they going to have a stronger functional impact. So first we did this for coding genes because we wanted to be sure that the metrics we apply before going into the rather unexplored non-coding world uh, work uh, because we know uh, what are the different functional impacts of mutations in coding genes well. So first we did that for coding genes and so what you're looking at here is the fraction of rare alleles on the y-axis and these are the different categories of coding genes. And as you can see that we really saw a very clear signal that the genes that are uh, not expected to have a big functional impact, the mutations in those genes, which is the loss of function tolerant genes, show a depletion of rare variants. And if you look at the genes that are the disease genes, and at, especially at the end of the spectrum, these are the cancer driver genes, they show an enrichment of rare variants compared to the random background, which is here. So these signals were small, but statistically significant to, uh, to make sure, uh, to tell us that, okay, we can use this metric now in the non-coding parts of the genome to discover new things. So that's what we did. We look at the, uh, like I said, this is germline organism level negative selection in non-coding elements. So here you're looking at the different uh, categories of non-coding regions, all from ENCODE data. And uh, this is, uh, as you can see, so this is the random background, the fraction of rare variants in the entire genome. And this is what you just saw for the coding variants. And as you can see, the different non-coding categories uh, enhances DNA's hypersensitivity size, transcription factor binding sites, non-coding RNAs show a small but statistically significant enrichment of rare variants, showing that they are under uh, some selection constraint, which was a message that was also uh, shown very nicely in the previous ENCODE paper and some other papers that came around that time uh, before our paper. But uh, the advantage that we had at that time was that we have thousands of samples from 1,000 Genomes Project, as opposed to the previous papers that were working with hundreds of samples. So we had much more statistical power. And what did that mean? That meant that besides looking at these very broad categories, we could now start looking at higher resolution. So for example, we could, uh, instead of looking at all the transcription factor binding sites, uh, we could look at the uh, binding sites of spe specific transcription factor families. And as you can see that once you start zooming in, you, uh, you see that the constraints actually differ a lot uh, on the for the different transcription factor families. And with the sample size, we can even go more higher resolution, which is uh, looking at the specific SNFs that can conserve or break transcription factor motifs. Uh, and this is a result I'm showing for two different transcription factor families, but this was consistent across all the families that we uh, checked, in fact, uh, all the families. And the consistent trend was that the SNFs that tend to break the motif tend to be under stronger selection than the ones that do not do that. And this was based on the PWMs. And this is what we expected, and we saw a nice clear signal, which was also shown in some other papers before. So that was, um, that was good to see that th this is uh, happening all over in, in the, from the SNP data in all the transcription factor families. So then we could also look at tissue specificity of these regulatory regions. So what we are lo what you're looking at here is the DNA's hypersensitivity sites from all these different tissues. This was all data from John Stamps lab and from ENCODE. And then this is the uh, coding genes, and this is uh, the genes that are expressed specifically in certain tissues all these tissues. And what you're looking on the y-axis is the fraction of rare variants. And as you can see that the fraction uh, is different for the different tissues. So we see a lot of tissue-specific selection constraints too. And what we saw uh, is that the ubiquitously, uh, ubiquitously expressed genes in bound regions generally tend to show stronger selection. And that, of course, as you can see in this slide, there is difference in constraints amongst tissues. And then constraints in coding genes and regulatory genes are correlated across tissues. So we only had this data for six tissues, which are marked in the same color in this plot, for which we had the regulatory regions and the genes that are expressed specifically in that tissue. But for whatever tissues we had that data, they were uh, correlated. So that was nice. 
So uh, then the question that we wanted to ask, and I'm sure everybody uh, wanted to know is, uh, well, what are the specific non-coding categories that are under very strong selection? Because even when you, we look at these broad regions, they, are nowhere cl they were nowhere close to the coding genes, even if you look at the uh, specific transcription factor binding uh, families. So what we did is, I don't have time to go into the details of the statistics, but this is all published work, so you can uh, look at it. So we, uh, so we looked at the, we divided the entire ENCODE categories into about 700 categories, and we uh, then d permuted all these categories, or, or, sorry, but yeah, permuted all these categories in the genome, keeping the underlying SNP structure constant, so to take into account the linkage disequilibrium. And we analyze the categories that come up under a negative selection based on this null model, which we uh, got from permuting these categories. So after we had that, we looked at the top categories that are under very strong significant selection. And this is what you're looking at. So when we look at the top 25 categories, which we call the sensitive categories, uh, they show a fraction of rare variants that's of course high because these were the top categories that came up. And then if you look specifically at the uh, very top, the top five categories, which we call the ultra sensitive regions, they show a very high fraction of rare variants. And this we call, uh, yeah, ultra sensitive regions. And an independent validation for this came from the fact that the known disease causing mutations from human gene mutation database are strongly enriched in these categories, the sensitive and the ultra sensitive regions. So uh, remember, we didn't use any disease data to arrive at these categories. The only two kinds of data we used was thousand genomes polymorphisms and ENCODE annotations. So we, uh, based on that, we said, okay, these categories cannot tolerate mutations. And then we think, and then we looked at the known non-coding mutations in human gene mutation database, and they're strongly enriched there, providing an independent validation that these are important regions. So of course, the question is, well, what are these regions? So uh, these regions contain binding peaks of some general transcription factors, for example, FAM48A, and core motifs of some TF families like June and GARA, and DNA's hypersensitivity sites and spinal cord and connective tissue. And I actually find this very interesting that some of the top categories that we are getting that are very resistant to mutations are actually not transcription factor motifs, which we uh, think disturb the uh, PWM, but it's rather, rather the DNA's hypersensitivity sites and this transcription factor, which is not binding to specific sequence, showing that maybe these uh, mutations can, or the mutations here can alter the chromatin structure, but we don't know that, but this is just based on what we get as a category. Okay, so I'm going to uh, briefly talk about uh, regulatory networks because that's something that we used in our approach, but I don't have uh, time to go into a lot of details of that. So, uh, so we constructed a regulatory network based again on ChIP-seq data from ENCODE. And uh, so we know the transcription factor binding sites for 119, we knew the transcription factor binding sites for 119 TFs, and then we knew the regions uh, that are assigned to the target genes uh, based on, the, so the assigning the promoters to the target genes is relatively easier, and then assigning enhancers to the target genes is more complex, and there were a lot of talks about that yesterday, and Zeping explained very beautifully what's being done now, so I won't go into the detail, but this was a correlation-based method, and based on these connections, there was this uh, network which consisted of 119 TFs and 9,000 target genes with 28,000 interactions between these genes. So, uh, in this network, if we look at the transcription factors and the target genes, we define the in-degree and the out-degree of these genes. And what we saw consistently was that um, the genes that are connected to more genes in this network uh, tend to be under stronger selection. So we uh, saw this using many different statistics, and the one that I'm using here is by looking at loss of function tolerant and essential genes. So essential genes tend to be more central and bigger, which means they're connected to more nodes, and the loss of function tolerant genes tend to be uh, smaller because the size of node is scaled by total degree. And um, so this movie was made by uh, Zainab, who is also in the audience here. So. Um, so with that, uh, I gave you some of the big features, but there were other features that went into the scheme, which we call FunSeq. And uh, the idea behind the scheme is that, uh, well, we have identified all these features in the genome that are resistant to mutations, all these regions in the genome. Now, can we put all this together into an algorithm to say, okay, if you give me a set of mutations, which one of them is more likely to have a strong impact? 
And uh, so if you, t uh, this is just for uh, example, if you start with cancer genome variants, which is about thousands of variants from a uh, cancer genome, uh, from a somatic cancer variants, and then you first filter the thousand genomes common variants, and then you look at the different functional annotations from ENCODE, basically, and then you look at the ones that lie in the sensitive and ultra-sensitive regions that we uh, derived at, and then you look at the ones specifically that cause disruption of transcription factor binding, and then you look at the ones that tend to target these highly connected genes in the regulatory network. So in the end, you reach about five to 10 variants in a cancer genome, uh, if you started with thousands of variants, if you go through the scheme. So now you are at a very reasonable number of variants, which you can then take to the lab and do all the functional validations to see, okay, these are really having a functional impact. So this part of the scheme can actually be applied also for the rare germline variants, and there's nothing specific just for cancer. But then we can, uh, if we have the cancer genomes, we can also include the signal of positive selection, which is looking at recurrence in multiple samples. Uh, so, uh, so that was the original FunSeq scheme, and then we developed this scheme further, which, was, uh, which we call FunSeq2, and this was published uh, in a genome biology paper in 2014. So the idea behind this was that instead of looking at all these features just as binary, we uh, converted them into a weighted scoring scheme. And the idea behind this weighted scoring scheme is, again, uh, training on the 1,000 genomes data. So if you're more likely to see a feature as uh, belonging to common polymorphisms in the 1,000 genomes data, then it's less likely to contribute to a strong deleterious function impact. So the, uh, so the weight is uh, give, derived based on the probability of the feature overlapping natural polymorphisms. So this is an entropy-based method, and uh, using this, we get a weight for each feature that I just described in the previous slide, and by summing those weights over all the features, each variant gets a score. And this, uh, this is available from this website, uh, and uh, the, uh, this uh, website uh, also is a web server, actually, where you can upload your variants and then uh, get the results. And if you want to look at the latest scheme that we are uh, using the, uh, uh, and a more extensive set of annotations, also including roadmap annotations, and this is a set we are using currently for Peacock, then you can also get it from GitHub. So, uh, so now I'm going to talk about the method that we are Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the method that we are developing, which accounts for all these complex covariates that we heard from Shamil and I described uh, a bit earlier. Uh, so the idea behind this is FunSeq looks at the functional interpretation, and uh, we want to include these signals of positive selection from the cancer genome, accounting for all these different, all the mutational heterogeneity. And that's what we are calling this composite driver because it's, uh, it's a composite signal based on the functional and recurrence signals. So in the original FunSeq scheme, the recurrence was uh, in, uh, input naively, but now we are uh, doing it more in a more sophisticated fashion, which is uh, to really say, given a number of mutations in a functional element, what is the likelihood that this, uh, these mutations are more recurrent and more functional than you would expect randomly? And this randomly is basically we have to take care of all these covariates in the feature space. So uh, if we are looking at promoters, then we have to compare with the regions that are also the, that are promoters. If we are talking about enhancers, then we have to compare with mutations in enhancers. So the basic idea of the scheme is we look at the um, this is shown for a coding gene, which these are the exons, but uh, it's the same scheme for promoters and enhancers. So you have the mutations, and we give the functional impact score to each mutation. And then we look at the recurrence of mutation across the multiple samples. And then we compute this composite score for each element, which is the functional impact score times recurrence. And then we say, well, okay, given this number of mutations, if I was to draw mutations from the random set, which is informed of these covariates, so the random set is picked from the same type of element from the feature space, and what is the, uh, what, what will I get? So that's how I, we generate the null background, which gives us the p-value for the composite score being as high as we see uh, for, the, for a given element. And the benjamin Horsberg method is used for uh, multiple hypothesis testing. So uh, I think you all heard from uh, a lot of talks that uh, these QQ plots, so QQ plots are basically a way of testing that our uh, test statistic is performing well. It's not inflated, and the p-values are not inflated. And as you can see, that we see nice QQ plots here. And uh, this is the result I'm showing for lung cancer samples. And we are applying this method on many different cancer types, all the, actually all the peacock samples. And 
This is data from TCGA, and as you can see, for the coding sequence, we get KRAS, which is a very, uh, no, very important lung cancer gene. And then if we look at the promoters and the uh, link RNAs, we get a novel candidate. So this is to show that our scheme is working. Uh, we are getting the known candidates, and then we are getting novel candidates. And I would just like to comment briefly that some of these candidates are in, indeed very interesting. For example, the WDR74 promoter, which we also found in prostate cancer that I'm going to just uh, describe and has been reported now in many other cancer types, including I think it was reported in breast cancer also uh, in the recent Stratton paper. And then uh, for link RNAs, we are identifying NEAT1 and MALAT1 in lung cancer and actually in many, many different cancer types. So these, I don't, we are still doing further functional validations on that and seeing if these uh, mutations are really having a driver effect. So uh, that was the result for lung cancer, and this is a result from 188 prostate cancer samples, again from data from ICGC and these published papers. And as you can see, the QQ plots look very nice. And uh, the gene that we identify is SPOP, which is the only known gene that uh, is significantly mutated. There are other important genes in prostate cancer, but that's because of rearrangements, not because of point mutation. So this is the only important gene, and we identify that. And uh, then we identify new uh, promoters and enhancers. And in the same uh, spirit that we heard already, we do, do functional validation using reporter assays. So this is for the WDR74 promoter, which we actually reported in the science paper. And uh, remember that we didn't really have a very big cohort at that time uh, in 2013. So we identified this completely based on the functional impact scheme FUNSEEK. And now actually many papers, when they looked at larger cohorts, including uh, William Lee's paper, and like I said, the recent uh, breast cancer paper, they are finding this uh, promoter promoter to be highly mutated. So then the other two examples are the red promoter and this genes promoter, which is too long a name. But, um, so we, but, but when we validated them, we, uh, we see the same effect as we predicted based on our uh, scheme's composite driver. So this shows the increased activity. And here we see decreased activity because of the mutations. So with that, I would like to first thank the uh, 1000 Genomes Functional Inter Interpretation Group where, because the, I was leading this group as part of the 1000 Genomes Consortium and FUNSEEK scheme was developed there and Yao uh, was a major contributor who is now at Bina. And this is when I was in Mark's lab and uh, I would then thank all the um, people in my lab and my collaborators at Weill Cornell with whom we are actively applying this uh, composite driver scheme on many different cancer types and really following up with detailed functional validation. And just to plug in to say that I'm looking for postdocs. So thanks a lot. Uh, I think this question for this talk maybe apply to other uh, uh, other talk as well. Sorry, so yeah. when you use the the histone mark, uh, diff, I mean the histone uh, element. Sorry, may, may, may can you uh, start from the beginning? I didn't hear the. Question. Oh yeah, yeah. Basically, the question is like uh, when you use the uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, let me say. Uh, the element. I mean the different uh, the, the functional region. To, uh, to look at the, the mutations or, or variants. So you basically you use the parental normal tissue, right? So in the cancer case, in when once you develop cancer, cancer have a different uh, landscape uh, of the histone modification, modification marks. So how much information can you do? Like you use normal as like a reference, but in the cancer, they have a different, uh, like a, uh, uh, enhancer or promoter, they can be changed. Right, how how right. do you think this kind of thing? No, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I would like to answer it two ways. So first is uh, because of the nice work of uh, Paula Keral and Shaman is here. Uh, you can see that actually the uh, histone modifications show a nice history of the cancer genome landscape. So even though they, they might have changed, this is, uh, this is when you see the relationship of mutations with the histone modifications that are obtained from the normal cell type, right, mm -hmm. the, the, in their mo random forest models where they're predicting the mutation rates, it's obtained from histone modifications from normal cell, not from the tumor cell, right? So because the, as the cell is progressing towards the cancer state, it's the original the histone modifications of the cellular state are from the normal cell state, right? And that's where the somatic mutations start accumulating. 
So all these covariates that you see are related to the modifications of the no normal cellular state. So when you can predict the mutation density from histone modifications, DNA is hypersensitivity is from the normal state. So that's, uh, that's one comment I would like to give. And the second comment is that what we are doing right now, which is uh, something I didn't discuss, is we look at these elements in the normal state, and then we actually see how the enhancers and the promoters themselves has changed. So the main data source that we have right now is DNA methylation. So we can see which regions got hypomethylated or hypermethylated, so the regulatory activity change. And fortunately, we have this data, um, as I showed in the peacock slide, that most half of the peacock samples are matching methylation and RNA data. So it's a wonderful resource to see how the regulatory elements change from the normal state to the tumor state. And we are uh, using that in our models. That's something I didn't discuss. Yeah, because uh, uh, like for the, the talk yesterday, like for the lung cancer, like a uh, lung cancer, you, you, you just may, uh, you use the adenocarcinoma, but in lung cancer, there are another type of uh, screamers. So that's the cancer, totally very different from the norm. I, I don't think uh, in the lung that that kind of normal, norm, norm, normal screamers. So uh, uh, in that case, if you use like a uh, uh, histone uh, multiplication mark from an encode, I don't know which case you are going to use. Yeah, so that's a very uh, dis highly discussed question. Uh, I think uh, Nicholas was asking that in the previous talk too. So uh, from uh, Shamil's lab, we have the data from Pol uh, past Polak, which is based on the mutations. But actually, if you look at the expression profiles, that can give you a very nice idea of which tissue you should use. Because even though the expression of a lot of genes changes in the tumor sample, if you match the expression from tumor with all the different uh, GTEx tissues, if you do principal component analysis, then the tissues, the tumor and tissues still uh, aggregate with the normal tissue type. So you can uh, choose based on that, that okay, this l looks like the cell type, you know, tissue type that I, I should use. Thank you. Uh, and nice plug for DNA methylation.